This is Joyful Enriquez, and welcome to the Blue Palette Podcast. This is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from professional marine artists and creatives around the world. This podcast is sponsored by the American Society of Marine Artists, a nonprofit whose purpose is to recognize, encourage, and promote marine art and maritime history. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today for this episode of the Blue Palette Podcast. This is Joy Fonriquez, and today I'm excited that artist Nicholas Fox will be joining us for today's episode. Nicholas Fox grew up in New York City and on Cape Cod. Coming from a sailing family, his greatest early memories are tooling around Stage Harbor in his O'Day Day Sailor and getting to steer a wet sail 63 from Egertown to Hyannis. In Chatham, Massachusetts, Nick worked at Chatham Bars Inn as a beach boy. When not rigging sunfishes for tourists and picking up towels, the job gave him many hours to sketch boats, water, and the sky. Graduating from Harvard College, Nick spent too many years toiling in boring offices while continuing to paint. A stint as a graphic designer and artist for a home furnishings company reawakened his desire to pursue painting as a career. He is represented by the Copley Society on Newberry Street in Boston, Massachusetts, and is a signature artist member of the American Society of Marine Artists. In 2019, he won the Rudolph J. Schaefer III Emerging Artist Award at the Mystic International. Nick now lives in North Chatham, New York, with his wife and children. He is currently the president and a director of the American Society of Marine Artists. Nick is also the founder of the new Center for American Marine Art at Mystic Seaport Museum. Man, I am so thrilled to have you today, Nick, and welcome you to the show and get the chance to talk to you a little bit about your life, your career, um, and what inspires you every day. So welcome. Well, thank you so much, Joyful. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm such a fan of yours, and it's really nice to be on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I think the I think the first time we actually got to meet was at the third annual conference for the American right. Society of Marine Artists, and that's the really the first time I got to meet you and see some of your work in person, and it just really blew me away. So when we started this podcast, I knew that I just I really wanted to talk with you and talk about your work and have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. I was blown away by your work too, and it was great to meet you there. So. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, what do you want to chat about? Yeah, well, I'd love to start off a little bit, um, you know, in your lovely bio, it was kind of talking a little bit about your background and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that. Kind of what got you interested, um, in painting, maybe some of your inspiration, a little bit about your education and kind of how you've developed, um, your career over the years. For sure. For sure. Well, um, you know, I loved painting when I was a little kid. I painted, uh, I, I in fact uh, spent a lot of my time painting uh, very strange uh, New York City skyline paintings. I painted probably a dozen of those. My parents wondered why I was obsessed with them. Uh, the other thing was I always painted uh, miniature soldiers. I loved uh, little uh, mm-hmm. military miniatures and I painted those and uh, drew had paintings of George Washington. I painted a George Washington portrait was my wow. first book, probably in first grade. I painted that. My mother put it on the wall. So it was always history and painting. For me. <laughs> anyway, but uh, coming from a sort of more business oriented family, um, despite my interest in art, even, you know, through school and college, I never did any, uh, I never did any art with any vision to becoming an artist. And mm-hmm. uh, I worked for a long time, as, as I said, in my bio, you know, I, got out of college. I went to work. I worked at a management consulting firm. I worked at a a creative management firm. I worked uh, at a university press. Um, I was a writer. This wasn't in my bio, but I wrote for PBS for a long time as a television writer. And, um, you know, it was, uh, all of that was, where whatever I was doing, I was always around art. So all of my offices were in New York City, so I could always go to the museums there. Mm. The Metropolitan Museum is my home museum. Uh, I, my, uh, our apartment was, overlooked the Guggenheim. Like I used to, when I, my childhood bedroom looked down onto the Guggenheim dome, that center dome. That's amazing. It was amazing. Yeah, what a place to grow up and have that much exposure to art. 
Oh, I mean, it was living on Museum Mile. That's what that's called, you know, from from basically the Cooper Hewitt down to the Frick and uh, maybe a little further. But that that stretch of, of Manhattan is one of the richest areas for seeing art. And it was it was there. I mean, I went to the Metropolitan every Wednesday afternoon with my mother, no matter what. Uh, wow. I was able to see, you know, and I love the arms, arms and armor and obviously Washington crossing the Delaware was there. It made a big impression on me, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I love that, but then, you know, working, you know, it distracts you. And, uh, I really didn't give a lot of thought to art. Uh, when my kids were little, uh, I, uh, did, you know, drawings of them with their, uh, with their favorite, uh, book characters. So there's this one drawing I did of my daughter with Zephyr the monkey in a Babar style drawing, uh, you know, watercolor with ink that, you know, it was, you know, she liked it. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, but then uh, I really became interested in painting. I, I did a lot of graphic design for my wife. She's a, she's a designer uh, mm -hmm. and a web designer. And she would say, hey, can you do this for me? And because I'm a computer nerd, as well as being, uh, a, a, a sort of business person, I was like, yeah, I can do that. So I was doing all of this graphic work, just doing, you know, actually doing the layouts that she was requesting. And I was yeah. like, wow, do I enjoy this? And uh, mm -hmm. then uh, my daughter was 14 years old. And if I told you this story, I'm sorry, but I'm now telling it to everybody. That's so okay. My, my, when my daughter was 14 years old and my she was homeschooled mm -hmm. and we enrolled her in a weekend uh, uh, it was a workshop, but it was like a masterclass workshop with a, with a local artist up here who paints in the Hudson River School style. Mm -hmm. And we enrolled her, she was 14, and the word came back from the teacher and from the, the organization that was running it that 14 is way too young, he's not a babysitter, uh, she has to have a chaperone in the class because she might be disruptive, and my daughter would, she was totally capable of taking the class by herself. Yeah. But, uh, but he was like, uh, you know, this could be really disruptive. And I said, and my wife said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you take this class? You're interested in painting and art. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if it's for me, but okay, whatever. So <laughs> I bought the materials. Uh, I went and I walked in. And when I saw how this guy painted, it was a complete revelation because I'd mm -hmm. only seen, it was really, it's a classical style. Uh, it's a glaze style. So it's indirect method painting that I really love the look of, I, you know, it's a very historic look. Uh, and I was like, I want to do this. And then I started painting and he was like, he fanned the flames a little bit. He was like, wow, are you an artist? And <laughs> it was just, you know, I think he was just trying to get me to buy another workshop, but uh, yeah, yeah. convinced me. Cause I was like, uh, yeah, no, I'm not, but I'm uh, anyway. So I, um, I got the bug then and I have, I've been painting ever since. And that was 2014. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, it, it was really amazing. Uh, and I'll tell you the style of painting is so distinct. Uh, and some of the work you see, uh, you saw on the slideshow there didn't really engage how much, uh, how antique some of my works were. So a friend of mine just came to my house the other day and she was looking at this painting on the wall and she said, you know, this isn't you. And I said, Oh no, that's me. She's like, this looks like an antique. And I'm like, right. That's the whole point. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, how did you do this? And I, I said, I said, well, it's glazes. And she's like, it's just a layer of antique. And I said, basically it's a layer of antique. <laughs> so, so it's very <laughs> funny. It. Um, but yeah, so that's how, uh, that's how I really started painting. But, you know, I, my mother was a fine arts major in college and got a master's in fine arts and, you know, my father was a musician and a composer, so we were always around artists and mm. uh, people like that. So, you know, it, even though we have this business background, uh, and in fact, my father was absolutely adamant that none of our, his kids become artists of any kind. And yet we're all mm. in the arts. So uh, he failed. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, for our viewers, um, you know, from talking, I know what you work with, but do you have a favorite medium or a specific medium that you work primarily in when you're working? Yes, uh, I, I basically only work in oil paint and okay. I work in uh, multiple layer oil paint. So like I uh, paint a dead layer. Are, are you familiar with the indirect method? I don't know if that's something that people know about. 
Yeah, I am. But uh, for our viewers, I think they would be very interested in kind of learning about the whole process of how you kind of build the painting from start to finish and the layers and all the, that goes into that. So if you could describe a little bit about that, that would be wonderful. For sure. For sure. So, so oil painting. So a lot of us are familiar with oil painting, like uh, in the modern era, uh, the impressionists are who most people think about, you know, obviously we know the Mona Lisa, right? right. Everybody knows what the Mona Lisa is and everybody knows the S S Sistine Chapel and everybody knows uh, the scream, you know, right. Uh, and so if we look at the, and then everybody knows Monet's water, water lilies or uh, those more, the impressionist paintings that are so vibrant and so much fun. Uh, so basically uh, until uh, the 1850s, it was very unusual to find people painting direct method painting. So mm -hmm. uh, what we know as the impressionist style it uses paint directly from the tube that's highly tinted uh, and it's used, you apply it to a canvas to create effects using these very vivid colors and exciting colors. Most of those colors and the ability to paint like that didn't really come about until after the 1850s because mm -hmm. uh, previously, uh, blue paint is one of my examples that I'd love to talk about. Yeah. Blue, if you wanted blue paint, basically you had to paint white and then glaze ground up lapis lazuli over it. And that was how you got a vibrant blue color. Yeah. Uh, and then in the 1840s and 50s, German chemists uh, came up with a bunch of chemical colors that were sort of the byproducts of the Industrial Revolution. But they were like, wow, this could be used as paint. Yeah. And yeah. suddenly these colors were vibrant, popping greens, reds, blues, things that never existed before. All, all your reds before were like matter rose and they were ground up uh, uh, flower petals, ground up pigments. And that was how you would end up tinting uh, the oil that you were mixing on a palette. Uh, yeah. You mix your own paint. So right. one, another major technological advance was the paint tube, which you probably know was invented in 1851. And the guy who invented it was a, was a sailor from Boston. And he said, hey, you know, there's this whole crimping technology that's come out of the Industrial Revolution. And you can put pretty much anything in a lead tube and squeeze it out and it'll be preserved. You just have to put a cap on. Yeah. So the Windsor and Newton Company bought the patent to the paint tube in 1853, I think. And that suddenly allowed painters to easily carry paint around in a, in a box. Because before that, you had to have a, you had a flat piece of leather. You would take your ground up paint and put it on the leather and mm -hmm. then squeeze the leather together and bind it up at the top. And that was your paint pouch. Wow. Not extremely convenient for painting outside. Yeah. You know, so so it's so there were a bunch of technological advances that suddenly allowed people to say, I'd like the Barbizon school was saying, let's paint outside. But you still had to take your mortar and pestle and your colors and grind them and mix them or these bladders. Uh, I, went, I re went recently to a constable show and, you know, constable, even though his English is often viewed as the father of French Impressionism, because all the French Impressionists saw the constable show. And mm -hmm. Constable's palette, his, his paint box is this, it's a, it's like a, it's like a fishing tackle box. And yeah. in it are all these bladders with little silver filigree tops that screw on to a, to a, 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 a sort of tied mount on these. It's really difficult. So, yeah. so, that, so the, all these technological advances made direct method painting the norm and actually mm -hmm. incredibly fun and, and easy to do. Before that, Many painters only painted in monochrome colors to plan a painting. So it was mm -hmm. only value work. So, yeah. you know, you know about grisaille and all of that, right? Yeah. So, so uh, painters painted those paintings basically so when collectors came to their studio, they could say, how do you like this painting? And how do you like this painting? And if they said, mm -hmm. oh, I love this one, then they would put color on it. Interesting. You know, I so, did not know about that. Yeah, it, it's uh, it was it, it it you know all of all of Rembrandt's studio it was filled with these monochrome studies that he painted either in grisaille mm -hmm. or in uh, burnt umber, and then somebody would say I like it and he would work it up with colored paint because it was so expensive you know to right. to, to use ground up lapis lazuli and like one of my favorite colors uh, is called asphaltum, which was very expensive because it was made of ground up mummies. They took the, the <laughs> resins that were used to to, uh, wow. to um, you know preserve mummies 
where uh, they would take pieces of the bandage and grind them up, isolate that, and then uh, grind it up to make the, this color asphaltum, which is very translucent. Wow. It's a very warm brown. It's a lovely color. Uh, anyway, so uh, the way I learned to paint was basically I painted in grayscale and yeah. then would lay colors on top. Uh, and now I'm a little more relaxed about my method because uh, you know, originally I really wanted to hew to this historical uh, method, mm -hmm. but in the end, it, it, there, I can achieve the same quality by just glazing over actual colored pigments, uh, which actually it, it frees me up to have some more time yeah. to work on glazing and finishing. So, yeah. But wow. I need to add one more story because this yes. is so much fun. So, uh, I tremendous one of my favorite painters uh, is. Um, uh, oh gosh, now I'm blocking his name. Or not, uh, Buttersworth. So Buttersworth, uh, do you know his work at all, Joyful? Yeah, I got to see several of his originals for the first time uh -huh. when I was doing um, the residency at the Mystic Seaport oh, Museum last year. Right. They have several, and that was the first time I'd ever seen his original work. Um, yeah. So isn't, yeah, isn't I'm it amazing. To it's look really at? amazing. Yeah. yeah. But um, so I was really into him and I was like, I want to paint my, my sail stitches the same way as, mm -hmm. as him. that was very like, and you know, they are perfect. You know, they're perfectly yeah. straight. They're perfectly curved for the sail. They, yeah. they catch the light perfectly. They're, they're highlight perfectly. And I wanted to know how to do it. So I wrote to every gallerist and museum curator who I could find where there were Buttersworths in their collection. Yeah. And I said, I really, how did they do this? And everybody wrote back with these theories and nobody really, <laughs> and they would be like, well, it was really, you know, you draw it with a pencil. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, the pencil would bleed through the, the graphite or the lead would bleed through the paint. So I know it's not that we know it's not that mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't ink for sure. And finally, I read an article about this famous forger named Ken Perenyi, who uh, there was an article about him in the New York Times. He actually wrote a book. Uh, and he was a forger who forged Buttersworths and Martin Johnson Heap paintings. And he was, oh my gosh. And he, and he sold all of these works through auction houses. And so, and the auction houses kind of knew that they couldn't possibly be real. I'm not saying they didn't know. They, uh -huh, they uh -huh. it, it was just, <laughs> I think it was beneficial. Anyway, Ken uh, is still alive. He's, uh, he's a wonderful painter in his own right. Uh, but I tracked him down and I said, Ken, you have to tell me how Buttersworth did this. It is, it is an absolute mystery to me. Is it, it, did he use some kind of jig? Was it, you know, all the lines are perfect. How? And he was like, nope, I'll explain it. And he laid out. Uh, this, it, it's an extreme, it's like an extreme sport where uh, I use a bar as a fulcrum for my arm when I'm trying to get my thing and yeah. you hold the brush uh, like this. You, you basically balance it on your hand and you, and you move your hand and you use whatever the curve of the, of the sail is, you, you, you move your arm on the fulcrum and then you drag, okay. you drag this uh, sable rigger across with uh with paint that's at like an ink like consistency it's it was a, it's an amazing process and but i couldn't do it until he taught me that and it's you also wow. have to roll down the canvas before you start doing it because otherwise it's too uh stiff. so there are all these historic oh so uh to answer the question there are these old style methods that i really like and because i i paint history paintings i think they yeah. should be painted like history paintings i want them to look like those paintings that i loved when i was a kid yeah so um so that's what I do. Hmm. So besides Buttersworth, uh, what would you say are maybe two or three other artists that have really inspired you or that you just excite you when you look at their work um, that you've learned from? Or Yeah, well, I mean, Buttersworth, of course, is, you know, the seminal American marine painter as, you know, yeah. that, that's the way I see him. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously John Singer Sargent, um, uh, Joaquin Soraya Batida. I don't know if you know Soraya. Um, he's yeah. a Spanish. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with Soraya. Oh, oh my gosh, he's unbelievable. He's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, Jacques Louis David was my when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to paint like him. Uh, so so uh, you know, it's it's very much an aspirational act for me is all of this painting, but um, you know, Winslow Homer, um, you know, I, uh, I have to say, 
you know, a lot of the, and then of course in modern painters, you know, Jasper Johns, I love, and uh, Mark Rothko. Uh, mm -hmm. These are, you know, and I, I love modern art. I'm not against it. Like so many, you know, I think a lot of representational artists feel a lot of anger and anxiety about contemporary art and modern <laughs> art. I, yeah. I don't, yeah. you know, so anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, that's great. So where you're at, where you are at right now um, in your career, are you specifically just focusing on painting right now, or do you do you have kind of another career path or or job or that you do kind of in culmination with your artwork, or is that kind of what you're just focusing on right now? Well, you know, I've gotten very interested. I, I've been doing a lot of admin work. So so one of the things so. Uh, I, because of my background in management, I was asked to uh, become the head of the American Society of Marine Artists. Yeah. And that was something that, you know, I knew it wasn't going to be, uh, you know, a huge uh, time commitment uh, because you know, I was familiar with a lot of the, of the moving parts of the society already. Yeah. Um, but as a result of this work, I've noticed a lot that could be done and a lot that could be achieved. And one of the things that's grown out of that is, for instance, um, the American Society of Marine Artists, while it uh, is about preserving American marine art, it's really about preserving the craft of American marine artists with working yeah. artists. Right. So one of the, the reason I started the Center for American Marine Art at Mystic was to uh, really draw attention to the fact that there is no single body that is tracking American marine art and it's it, through its history. So there are lots of organizations, right. there are small marine artists, there are small marine art collections all around the country. There are collectors, private collectors, there are, you know, museums, uh, and then there are large museums like the Met and, you know, and uh, the MFA where, or I went to the National Gallery last week and they have a huge number of fabulous American marine works in a very small corridor in uh, uh, these tiny little galleyway, you know, uh, slots where they have them hanging on, you know, basically pegboards. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is where these are? Like, I didn't even yeah. know you were these. So the Center for American Marine Art, the goal is to actually create a registry of all of these works around the country. So we know what's it's out amazing. there and where yeah. they are. And, you know, if you're, if you're interested in learning about a particular artist like Buttersworth, you'll be able to find all of the Buttersworth paintings in one spot and be like, oh, wow. this is what this guy did. And that's amazing. Impression. Yeah, so, so, but, so that's become a real passion for me. Um, you know, I've recently been uh, really interested by the uh, National Maritime Historical Society. Uh, you know, I, we did a, we just did an invitational show with them and uh, I was down there in Washington for their annual dinner. And then I went to the, uh, Council of American Maritime Museums Conference uh, at the, um, uh, what's it called? The Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in, uh, in um, gosh, I can't, St. Michael's, Maryland. Uh, okay. And yeah. it, was, it was phenomenal. It was just a great experience. And I really think that there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of maritime art and maritime mm -hmm. history in this country. Yeah. So, no, I think that I think that's really important. Um, personally, as, as someone who is interested in history or is fascinated by history, um, that kind of work and that and these types of things that you're doing, yeah, I just think they're really important. Um, that we don't lose some of these, even even what you were talking about with the paint tubes and like the patents and how that. I mean, I don't think. I think today, a lot of us, we don't even think about things like that, just how much what we're able to do and accomplish in art today um, is credited to all these people who've invented technology like this that makes our job so much easier. And that it's important not to lose touch with that, with the development of different art technologies and kind of how other artists throughout the ages have kind of paved the way for us and what we do now. And I think it would be really sad if we if we lost that information, if we weren't able to learn from that. Um, so thank you for what you're doing uh, with the center. And um, I think that's really important. So thank you for sharing about that. 
Well, you're very, it's, it's my pleasure. And it's also, it's also an honor to be able to work in this field and uh, be able to speak about these things. I will say something important for all the marine artists out there, for all the artists out there listening yeah. to this. Um, you know, one of the things that I often, I, I'm, a, I'm a big tech guy. I love using any tool I can find to help me improve my work. If it's Photoshop or Unreal Engine or Blender or uh, Rhino, which is a, you know, these are building 3D models. Um, I, I have a lot, a lot of artists uh, evince some concern about technology. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, certainly many of our peers in the society are, you know, say, I don't believe in technology. I don't care about it. I'm an artist. We're doing this antique, uh, you know, uh, art form that, you know, you, you, if you wanted technology, you could just make it on a computer. I said, and I said, well, sure, that's fine. You can yeah. say that. But the reality is, you know, painting has benefited from technology since day one. Right. There's no need to be afraid of technology. Paper towels. Let's just talk about paper towels for one yeah. second. I don't, do you use paper towels when you're painting? Yes. Okay, so do I. Do you <laughs> know any other painter, painters who don't use paper towels? And yet no. we never talk about, we never say, oh, well, I don't like to use paper towels. I'd much rather use, you know, rags from coaling, you know, cleaning out the coal bin. I, I don't know, you know, so I like, I, I yeah. really have to say, you know, and meanwhile, I also use something so antique that most people think it's crazy. Mm. Uh, for, my, uh, for my solvent, I use uh, um, rosemary oil. Really? So, okay. Uh, I, use, I use essential. I use I use lavender oil. It's very expensive. Yeah. But now I use rosemary oil. Uh, and a couple of colleagues have said, like, "Well, wow, that's crazy. You know, how long your painting is going to last?" And I'm like, "Well, Leonardo da Vinci used rosemary oil in his paintings. So, hmm. how long is it going to last? It's a good question. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's organic and it's not volatile. And once it dries, it's forever." So, um, so it's a, it's one of the, th and also as a result, I have a very healthy studio. I can, you know, I don't think I would, I, I do use one chemical product, which is called Neo McGill from, uh, from, yep. uh, oh gosh, who is it? It's, I think uh, it's Gamblin. Is it's it? Gamblin. Oh, I love yeah. Gamblin. Gamblin. Gamblin is my favorite. Yeah. They're my, I really, I'm a big fan of Gamblin. Um, and their Neo, Neo McGill is, is, I think that's a witch's brew of chemicals. However, I love it. <laughs> So, um, but other than that, um, yeah. I could basically eat anything in my studio. Wow. That's amazing. I don't use, and I don't use heavy metal paints. That's the other thing I don't use. So, okay. What, what that, type that, of paints do you use? Uh, well, I use all Gamblin things. I, my, my favorite Gamblin color is uh, lead white replacement, which okay. is of course non-toxic and, uh, but it has all of the warmth of lead white. And are you familiar with lead white and why? I no, love it so no, okay, I'm so, not. So antique paintings, you know, that very creamy, warm white that's in those paintings mm -hmm. that was that was derived from scraping sheets of burned lead uh, into into a uh, linseed oil mixture. And it would, mm -hmm. it would bleed. The burned lead would create this bleached white material. So it was a very but it was warm. It was an incredibly beautifully warm color. And so for years, I mean, I knew I actually know a painter who hoarded it. Like he has like the last seven tubes of wow. lead white uh, of this, of this uh, lead white. And now I was like, well, have you tried the lead white replacement? He's like, ah, no, no. I mean, painting with that lead paint at this point is yeah. bonkers. Like, I don't know what he's doing, but, right. but you know, <laughs> you know, it's great. I, I think any, anything you want, but uh, I love studio safety and gambling is really, and by the way, gambling does not sponsor me. I'm not, a, you know, I don't, yeah, <laughs> but I I love their paints. I love their products. So, hmm. yeah, I I always thought it was funny. Uh, in regards to that you're talking about the lead paint, is uh, being a history nerd. Uh, that that kind of the I don't know what the right word is for um, the stereotype maybe of kind of like the crazy artist. Uh, you know, or the, like the artist that's just kind of out there in their own little world in their own head and is in touch with reality. Like that kind of persona came from artists, um, that use lead paint and would, would wet their brushes. And so they were every day basically slowly poisoning themselves yeah. by ingesting lead and, <laughs> and while, that, that, while that they actually were time. kind of going crazy a little yeah, bit <laughs> while they were sniffing time on top of yeah it. so and many of you know I, I i it is uh it's an amazing 
you know, studio safety is something that I, everybody has to take seriously. And if you yeah. don't know about, you know, the heavy metal paints uh, and you don't know about, I mean, and now there are still people who use turpentine. I know a guy who still uses, you know, just, wow. yeah. you know, and you're like, wow, you know, you, this is dangerous for you. Like you will get nerve damage. You will lose the feeling in the tips of your fingers by the time you're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, older. Uh, yeah. But it's like, well, it's what I used to learn to paint with. And I'm like, wow, well, okay. I guess so. Yeah. You know, I learned to drive in a car with no seatbelts, but right. you know, I wear seatbelts. <laughs> so. uh, what kind of, so for our listeners and stuff, you're talking about, you know, these things like being careful with the studio practices, uh, what types of paints uh, would you recommend people staying away from once that you said that are heavier metals and, and, and since you don't use turpentine, what do you use so far as solvents for cleaning your brushes and things like that? Sure. Sure. Uh, well, uh, for, um, it, first of all, anything with cadmium, uh, anything with cobalt, I don't use. So I, you know, I try to stay away. I, there are many, there are plenty of synth synthetic paints that come very close to those colors. Uh, many, many painters say, I need my cadmium red. I need my warm cadmium yellow. And yeah. I just, no, you don't, you just don't, you know, you can use a Naples yellow. That's very warm. Uh, you can use, there are any, any types of yellows you want. And then if you want to cool it down or heat it up, you use red or white, you know, you don't have yeah. to use anything that uh, uh, is toxic. Um, you know, and like cobalt blue is a beautiful color, you know, but it's mm -hmm. made out of cobalt and yeah. you know, Right now, the world needs all of its cobalt for batteries, I guess. So, you right. know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, in terms of, and in terms of solvent, uh, I started out using OMS, the Gamblin uh, odorless mineral spirits. That's great. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it just because it's odorless doesn't mean it's not, uh, it's not volatile. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why I got, because we, I, my kids were little when I started painting. Uh, mm -hmm. My son was, you know, eight or nine. And, you know, my studio is right off the living room, incredibly enragingly, because I hear every conversation. Right. And when somebody trundles through, it's often, uh, it'll jar the brush or make my desk move. Uh, it's an old house. So, uh, but, so I was on, I was, I was really searching for uh, things that wouldn't be toxic for any neural development of my kids. And uh, then I was reading, um, and I can't remember. It's a it's an iconic book in everyone's art history class. I I can't remember what it's called. I have it on my desk, but it's artists and their materials. I think it's called. It's like a seven hundred page book, starting okay. with Van Eyck and you know the, how Jan Van Eyck and his sister and his brother invented oil painting uh, yeah. and discovered you know vernice lucida, which is the clear varnish, uh, which you know that's what everybody have been looking for since the beginning of time because. You know, you own a castle and you have a painting up in it and, you know, there's no glass for the windows. So weather just comes through and you, your painting gets wet and your wood gets wet and the yeah. painting's clean and you got to buy a new <laughs> one. And, uh, and, you know, the, and so the idea was if you can paint with your uh, pigment suspended in linseed oil, uh, which was clear, you know, that was one of the reasons why linseed oil was used and then varnish it. Uh, but the problem was that all varnish was derived from boiling pitch, right? Uh, tar mm. from pine trees. And uh, so the search for uh, a clear varnish, vernice lucida is what it was called, right? Yeah. Uh, was like that was the technological push. And like Leonardo, for instance, when he was painting, you know, it, it, painting in France in particular was like, I can't get clear varnish. If I could only get clear varnish, I could <laughs> good paintings. <laughs> and uh, and his his method was he felt that if he, he used some of this uh, varnish that had a distinctly uh, brownish tint and would often get darker with age, he mm. would paint them and then he would leave them in the noon sun for a couple of hours every day until he felt that the varnish had been bleached enough by the sun, wow. by the UV radiation. So, yeah. but of course, one of the problems was because you had the wet paint drying underneath and you had the varnish drying on top, and you had moisture from the wood in the back from the condensation from the sun hitting the varnish. That's why so many of his panel paintings are cracked in the center. Mm. Uh, because, uh, and yeah. there, was, there was a lot of cracking because of that. And he would often say, he, apparently that was a big problem for him. So when the Van Eyck's came up with Vernature Lucida, which was it, which allowed you to, to then lay color in, in a clear varnish, uh, 
it revolutionized oil painting because now you had these basically ultra preserved paintings that wouldn't you know be affected by moisture and rot. So I mean it it was an amazing technological discovery. Uh, yeah. But um, but it was you know using what mediums they use. So so uh, I like as I was saying I use rosemary oil. Um, lavender oil is also works. These are essential oils that you can, you know, I wouldn't drink them, but you can put them on your, like the, I buy, uh, you know, organic, uh, what's it called? Spa grade, uh, medical grade oil, which is, you know, yeah. I get a big canister of it. Um, and it's five pounds of it and it does cost like 150 bucks, but it lasts like three years. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, for me, it's worth every penny. Um, then, uh, I just use linseed oil as a medium, uh, if I need, and then sometimes I use that, uh, the, uh, the Neo McGill, which okay. even, even when it was originally formulated and, you know, all painters had different versions of it, uh, you know, it was, you know, it was a secret thing. Everybody had their own little Neo McGill. Yeah. Recipe. yeah. <laughs> that was a toxic witch's brew. Every one of them. I mean, I, you know, I think they were all losing their minds over it. So yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So th that's that's all I use. And then for brushes, I I just buy the cheapest brushes I can. The only brushes I indulge in are Rosemary and Company Sable Rivers. Yeah. So those are they're they're just for me. And I I'll burn through one probably one a painting. Like you know it'll last me one painting, and then I have to get wow. another one because I, right. I use them. You know I use them yeah. very well, very nicely. And then I'll leave a painting for a day, and the the it begins to harden and I have to clip yeah. away the, the little uh, out, out liars and then, but uh, I love those brushes, but everything else I just buy at like mm -hmm. uh, Michael's crafts, yeah. you know, I go and buy the little plastic boxes of brushes. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Man, that's awesome. So what kind of, um, so far as your surfaces, what type of surfaces are you normally painting on when you're working? So uh, I really like panels uh, because uh, panels stack easier once they're dry mm -hmm. for me. So I really like them. And I have, I don't have a huge studio, mm -hmm. uh, but my panels are, I generally buy um, artboard panels. Uh, sometimes if they're very large, I buy them mounted. Uh, but mostly I just buy the panels and cut them down because I, I do a lot of smaller paintings. Okay. Uh, and then um, I gesso them. Uh, to have a sort of linen-like pattern in them. So I use gesso very thick and mm -hmm. I brush in one direction and then I brush the other direction uh, and then I let that dry and then I do the same thing. So by the time gotcha. I'm done, the, the panel has a lot of grab, uh, okay. but, I, but then I sand in between painting layers. So by the time I'm done, the painting is almost glass smooth. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you have a project right now that you're working on? Yes, I do. I actually have two that I'm working on right now. Um, but uh, a collector contacted me and he wanted a painting of the Widda galley, which have you ever heard of the Widda? Mm -mm, no. So, uh, okay. So in, in this ship was built in 1715 in London and it was built to be a slave galley mm -hmm. and it was captured by uh, a pirate. I can't remember whether it was Henry Every. I can't remember which uh, which pirate was the main pirate involved. And it ended up in the in the under the command of Black Sam Bellamy, who was mm -hmm. uh, I guess shortly after capturing this one ship and using it as his pirate flagship, uh, was the richest pirate ever in 1715. He was the richest. <laughs> he had billions. Of pirate gold doubloons, whatever they had. Um, and the ship, uh, there is, uh, and it's the only pirate ship that's actually been found. So it foundered off the coast of Cape Cod, where I grew up. And I actually, I've been many times to where it foundered. Uh, and it, the wreck was discovered in 1993 by a guy walking on the beach. And so, and it's the, it's the only reliably like if they found the bell they found all of this historical data wow. that corresponds to the ship so they know it was this ship so uh my collector is a big fan of um the of the archaeologists working on it yeah. and he uh is interested in a number of things about it so uh one of the challenges though is that the best record for what the ship looked like 
uh, is a Royal Navy Corvette that, you know, and these are, a galley is a ship that can be rowed. And yeah. the Corvettes, uh, they had their oar deck, the oar ports were on the upper deck. So mm -hmm. it worked for a slaver, but we don't know exactly what the ship looked like. There's no, uh, there are no plans for it. There isn't a model of it. There's right. only, there's a best guess. So one of the challenges of painting it, it, because I'm really interested in history and making things historically accurate, is how do you delineate something that you know was probably there mm. versus what, you know, you're now going to represent it. All right. And so, uh, uh, so for this, I, I used the, the museum, the, the Widow Museum on Cape Cod has a model of the, one of these Corvettes that they use as the, as the sort of visual representation of the ship. So I used that, I took, got drawings off of that and uh, was able to use that to build the 3D model of the ship and then pose it. Wow. And, uh, but I also wanted to get across some of the drama of piracy, uh, but because we don't know what the ship actually looked like and especially yeah. what, what it looked like after Black Sam Bellamy and his crew took over, we know they modified it, they added guns, they added all this stuff, but we don't know exactly where or how. So I ended up putting the, um, the I, I framed the painting with a ship that's about to be captured and boarded. Mm -hmm. And the widow is in the background coming down a very rough sea uh, to, to basically fire a broadside and then board. And uh, so the ship is a little far away. I don't want to say I cheated, but I put it in the background and there's a lot of aerial perspective that separates. Yeah. And uh, just so... If anybody's listening or watching and doesn't know what aerial perspective is, it just means the the fall the mist of air that is between you and a subject that's far away. Yeah. So so that it's it's a little obscured. The boat is a little sure. obscured by by sea spray, by the foam, by the waves, by the sails. So you know, I wouldn't you know, I work with a lot of historians now and I talk to them a lot. And yeah. I never want to paint anything yeah. where they're gonna say, like, well, can you justify this? Um, and I, if I, if I can't justify it, so everything yeah. in the family is justified. Wow. So, well, yeah. it sounds like a really exciting, but challenging project and almost as if to, you have to put as much or if not more time into doing the research for the painting oh. as the actual painting itself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably spend for every, I, I would say for every hour at the, at the easel, Mm -hmm. um, I work for three hours, not at the easel, wow. easily. I would say that, that, that is a, that's a, it, it's three to one, I would say. Wow. Yeah. Man. So that would, I think that would be really challenging then as a professional artist to price your work, uh, or to figure out, you know, for selling the worth of that, since you're putting in, you know, so much, there's so much more that goes into it than just the actual painting of the painting or, or, or getting the source material or whatever that you're, you're painting from. I mean, yeah. how do you, how do you figure that out? Well, uh, basically I say, what's it worth to me all the time and effort involved? You know, if mm -hmm. there's, if, uh, for instance, uh, a ship like the Chesapeake, so, you, you know, the Chesapeake was an American warship that was sunk by the British uh, fascinatingly, uh, its timbers were taken to use to, and used to build the Chesapeake Mills in England that are still standing. So you can go see the actual timbers of the ship. Yeah. But I built a, I built a really highly detailed 3D model of the Chesapeake. And so that, you know, if somebody says, oh, gee, I want, you know, the Chesapeake here or there, that painting is going to take a lot less time because I have already done all the research. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I'm, and also the Wida is there. If the Wida is in the background, because it's an accurate ship for 1715, I'll be able to use it in a painting of the Boston Harbor that I'm working on. For I'm, I'm, you know, Boston is Boston is my favorite subject, and yeah. I've been working on a massive model of it to create. And I just I painted a, a boatyard scene. You know, this cove, which has all been filled in, it no longer exists. And you know Long Wharf. Have, have you been to Boston? Do you know Long Wharf? I have never been to Boston. Oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> there's this place called Long Wharf. It's here. And I've always wondered why it was called Long Wharf because it's not that long. You know, all the time I was in college and a kid going around Boston, you go to Long Wharf and there was no. It wasn't very long. And yeah. uh, what has what what happened? And I read about it. it was like oh, it was a wharf that was a third of a mile long. 
And I was like, well, now it's a few hundred feet. I don't know what the big deal is. But it turns out that basically all of the land in Boston from uh, just two blocks down from the old state house is landfill. And before that, it was a giant rounded cove. And now it's just wow. a straight line. Uh, but it was a rounded cove that was filled with shipyards. And all of these ships in the 18th and 19th century were built on the, well, more, more 17th and 18th, I should say. 17th and 18th century, all these ships were being built right in the center of Boston, under, wow. under areas that are now highway <laughs> roads and office buildings. And, you know, there was a massive fort that the British built on a thing called Fort Hill. Even Fort Hill is gone. Wow. They, they, they demolished it. They, they used it to fill in this landfill here uh, that filled in behind uh, the, the wharf. And uh, then Beacon Hill, which you might have heard of, Beacon Hill in Boston. It's a it's yeah. this big hill with the state house on it. Um, Beacon Hill used to go up another 90 feet. And they took that 90 feet of hill and used it to fill in the old mill pond uh, near the north end, which is wow. now, it's now called Haymarket. But I mean, Boston has changed so much. And trying to re represent the mm. history of Boston in, uh, you know, historical paintings that are accurate, it's extremely difficult but it is my it's my moby dick that's what i right. want to achieve my whole yeah. life because uh yeah. the city you know also boston burned down every eight years so you know what did it look like in 1680 <laughs> what did it look like in 1690 what did it look like in 1712 yeah. um and it's you know i i just it's a, it's a really fun challenge and really interesting mm -hmm. place to work so but in terms of pricing my work uh, my my paintings are expensive yeah, you know, I think yeah. I think people see them and they're like, "Wait, why are you charging so much more?" Uh, it's because you know a, you you don't see the work that goes into it. Right. Yeah. You know, there's only one of them. You know, the, you will. You're the only. You, you're the owner of this one historical work that is as good history as I can do. Um, right. So, yeah. You know, you know, and they take time because they're multi-layered. You know, I know wonderful painters who can paint a painting in two days. My paintings take six weeks to a month, you know, right. uh, a month to six weeks or even more. Like I, I yeah. painting, this painting of the widow, I've been working on since April. Yeah. <laughs> like the beginning of April, I think I started it. So yeah. 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 And do you ever feel like when you're spending that much time on a piece that you get tired or have, I don't know, like worker, like artist block or something? I mean, how do you how do you deal with kind of like the longevity of one piece kind of like staying with it? Because I'm sure, you know, you must get tired. Well, I'll tell you that. You're, sure. Well, no, I don't. And I'll, okay. I, I can explain why. So okay. uh, one of the one of the so I, I think I mentioned I was a writer for a while. And mm -hmm. one of the great things uh, that I, I learned early on as a writer is that there's no such thing as writer's block. Mm. It's just that you you don't know enough about your subject to figure out the solution, right? Mm. So so okay. anytime I'm feeling like I don't know what to do next, yeah. I do more research because that's okay. the that's the that's the real challenge is to make sure is to and then as you know from painting, whenever you sit down to paint, it's an epiphany. Mm. You learn something new about yourself as an artist. You learn something new. You see something that you never saw before. And yeah. that's, that to me, like, and, you know, if I was just doing work after work after work, I think I might lose some sense of that. But because I'm mm -hmm. so focused on one thing for so long, yeah, I get, you know, and by the way, I, I know that my style isn't for everybody. And like, I have wonderful painter friends who are like, I could never spend three, a month on a painting, one painting. Yeah. Or two months on a painting, and uh, it was—I uh, have to say—it's it, it makes me so happy. I get so much pleasure out of it, and I go back in. Mm. And one of the great things about painting multiple layers is I can wash off the last layer and go back. It's like I, I can hit undo if there's if yeah. I come in the next morning and I'm like, "What the heck did I do yesterday?" Yeah. Uh, then I can just the linseed oil. Uh, I just put it, brush it on. And wherever I didn't didn't like what I did, I can just wipe it off, and I won't get down to the lower levels. So yeah. painting is still there. Hmm. I don't know. I love yeah. it. That's awesome. <laughs> I I think there's something to be said for creating works that you have enough fortitude and patience and care 
to spend that long on one piece. I think especially today and kind of like this social media heavy, um, that there's this expectation that you just need to be whipping out pieces every day or every week just to have something to show people. But I think a lot of care and artistry and masterworks come from people who dedicate time. It's not about, oh, what can I quickly show people that I'm doing? But, you know, you're cultivating this experience and you're giving it enough time with the piece to really flush it out fully and create something that's really going to last and be memorable. And that I don't think that kind of art happens overnight. No, no. I, I mean, I, I do think I just want to say I, I, I and I. There are many artists I admire who can paint a la prima and yeah. put out a brilliant something so brilliant and evocative and meaningful in three hours. You know, I work with some plein air painters who blow my mind and I'm like, yeah. I, I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. But, you know, if we were all the same, then what would the art world be? You know, and so I, so like, I have right. to say like, I like what I do. And I, I know at, at the end of this, you'll probably ask me about my social media. I don't have any. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have, I have, a, I have a website uh, yeah. And I have a little bit of a YouTube channel called uh, The Painter Studio. But other than that, and there are three videos on there about how to paint water, just in terms of technical terms, because I think yeah. a lot of people get stressed out about how to do that. Right. Um, and uh, once you understand the science of it, then the aesthetics come over time. It's not a you know one shot. You learn how to do it and you're done. Um, but you know, for me, I love the way I paint. It's very, it's very. Um, you know, relaxed and, uh, you know, while exacting, it is relaxed. I don't feel hurried ever to finish a work. And in fact, this painting of the Witta, I was supposed to finish this by May 1st. And that was the deadline my collector gave me. And I called him and I said, look, uh, I want another month with this and then I've got to get it framed. I have to find the right frame for it. And he said, he's like, I don't care. Give it to me whenever. If it gets here by Christmas, I'll be happy. <laughs> It's a great, great, you know, and we made a lot of money for it. And he said, this is when I want it. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy he gave me the, the free time. But, anyway. mm -hmm. yeah. Man, so over, just kind of thinking about as we've been chatting here, just thinking about over the years and kind of listening to your story, um, what would you say are some of the challenges that you faced along the way in terms of being able to create um, and to do the type of work that you enjoy, um, maybe some things you've overcome, or I know a big one is sometimes with artists trying to balance uh, studio and work and home life. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that and maybe um, even kind of what a, I guess a typical day would be for you uh, working on, you know, some of your admin tasks and painting and trying to balance all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of challenges, I would say the biggest challenge I, or, and I, I wouldn't call it a challenge. I would, I, well, I guess it's called a challenge. Um, my, I live very near an ASMA fellow named Len Tantillo, mm -hmm. who is a internationally famous history, Marine art, Marine history painter. And Len is, just the, he's become a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. And, and I have to say mentor is a good word because if you add TOR at the beginning of that, uh, it, uh, you know, he has become also my tour mentor. So, <laughs> so Len, uh, Len was able to took me in hand. He said, well, I see what you're doing. You're doing okay. If you want to become a really good painter, here's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And then every time I have just, been jumping through hoops trying to make him happy with my paintings since since I met him and he and we just had a great conversation where I we, he was looking at this uh this uh widow painting that I'm painting because I'm like what do you think and he just ripped it to shreds in front of me and I was like oh. <laughs> and I said I said you know I I said and he's like what well, what did you want from me and I said well uh I said you know I want I, I guess I wanted you to say wow this is great and of course, and of course he, he said, without skipping a beat, he's like, well, you know, I would never say that because, <laughs> because his, whole, his mission is to help me learn. Right. right. And, and he's, he's trying to make, and 
you know, one of the things I'll say this, and there's one thing I, I will say from the very beginning of my painting, I have, uh, there's a, there's a saying in software development, uh, which is for agile development of software. If anybody's out there listening to it and they don't know these terms, forget it. Don't worry. You don't need to know. But uh, the, the idea is to increase your rate of fail. It's called your rate of failure, but they call it increase your rate of fail uh, hmm. in iterating uh, what you're doing in software. And I said, you know, that's the only way I'm going to be able to continue painting. Because from my first paintings, you know, people, I, I, the, the people, I, my friends are so nice. And they all said, oh, your painting's great. I love your painting. You're so uh -huh. cool. And my wife was sweet and my kids were nice. And they were like, oh, this is a great painting, Daddy. So I was very mm -hmm. happy with it. But at the same time, I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't hitting all the bases I needed to hit. Mm -hmm. So then I said, I do not care what I do. I'm going to paint for at least two hours a day, every day. And I will get all of those bad paintings done. There's another saying in the art world where it's like you have, what is it, 500 bad paintings that you have to paint before you can become good. Mm. And I think I hit 500 bad paintings in my third year. So it was like, it was really great of our second year. And I just kept painting terrible painting after terrible painting and then learning from those and yeah. each and and i i have to say if i'd been more uh critical of myself um i think i would probably have given up mm -hmm. but you know now i can say with some authority never give up you know when i i started i started a life drawing class when i first started painting i was like i should probably learn to draw well you know i i i'm i was a good drawer as a kid yeah. and even as a grown up, but then I was like, I should learn to life draw. So I went to this life draw group. The people there were phenomenally good. They were just wonderful <laughs> artists. And I'm drawing these, you know, gaunt stick figures who look mm. like they're about to drop dead. And I'm like, <laughs> this is a terrible drawing. But I let myself fail again and again and again. Mm. And now, you know, five years later, I, you know, we have a joke in the group that it's like whoever does the best drawing in the night gets to go to Italy. And so, you know, on some nights, I'm the guy who gets to go to Italy. So I feel very happy. Uh, so, so, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think failure being, not being afraid to fail and embracing those failures as an artist is the most important thing because you have so much to learn. Yeah. And this is the thing that people, and then when you see these artists who can paint a painting, a brilliant work in three hours in a plein air session, what you don't see as, a, as somebody watching that is the, hundreds and hundreds of hours they had to spend to learn how to do that well. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that many people are just like, oh, I could never do that. And it's like, no, you absolutely could. You just have to put in the time. Right. And, uh, you know, and that's something that I encourage everybody to do because painting is so much fun, no matter yeah. how you do it, whether you do it as an amateur, whether you do it on weekends, whether you do it mm -hmm. for a living, uh, you know, don't be afraid to paint. It, it's, it, it is, you know, sharing what you see in the world is the one thing that really separates us from animals. We are able to share, you know, what mm -hmm. we see and say, this yeah. is how I view the world and what I value to another human being. And if they can connect with that, mm. I mean, that's the magic of being human. Yeah. So, mm. At the end of the day, when someone looks at your work and walk away, what is it that you really want them to take away? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, so my overpowering emotion since I was a kid has been a, a historical longing that I can't explain. I love, I love projecting my time travel, you know, all that stuff. I love, yeah. uh, you know, and, but appreciating the past and appreciating art in history and appreciating history uh, being able to have someone feel that moment a little bit, that's a little bit like time travel. And that's yeah. what, you know, if I could give that, if I can give that to somebody and they can say, wow, you know, I, I can almost see this. That's my dream. That's what mm -hmm. I want. I want people wow. to feel that they can, they can time travel in my work. So. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I've never thought of it that way, but I guess now, yeah. you know, yeah. That is, that's something very special, um, you know, and not everyone can or has the ability to do that. 
Um, and I think what makes creating this type of work so special, I guess unique uh, with maritime and marine art is having this ability to transport people um, to another place or another time and share in that experience. Um, Cause there, I mean, just thinking about there's so many people that, you know, are if you're painting a historical ship, obviously they've never been there, but anything that's on the water, a lot of people don't even know what that's like to live by the water, be around the water um, and kind of that very peaceful, magical experience that you get um, when you're surrounded by a large body of water. I mean, there's not, well, there's I mean, not a lot of thing. things like it. You know, your paintings are incredibly exciting for me because, you know, I'm not a diver. I will never dive. I'm afraid of mm -hmm. diving. Um, but when I see what the world that you share, that's incredibly thrilling to me. It's exciting mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. Oh, and thank you. you convey that sense of majesty and peace and beauty so well in your work. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it's, that's, it's a gift that you are giving the world when you paint a painting. And it's really wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I, I feel like when you were talking earlier about, um, if I were honest, the, one of the things is that I struggle with as an artist is being um, kind of afraid of failure. Uh, like almost this pressure when I'm working that I want to do these animals justice and the experience justice almost to the point where um, I have this anxiety about that every piece has to be perfect or be a masterpiece. Um, and that's just really not how the creative process is <laughs> or that like when you're focused so much on just trying to make every piece a masterpiece, sometimes you miss out, you lose some of the joy uh, of just, it's fun to paint, you know, and that yeah. if you're so afraid, yeah, it kind of takes away from that joy. And then being able to be honest with yourself and your work and say, you know, every piece doesn't have to be a masterpiece, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value because I can look at it and say, okay, this worked really well and this did not work well. And what can I learn from that? And what can I bring from that experience into the next piece that I do? Yeah. Like you said, so hopefully 500 paintings later, I'm actually achieving what I really set out to achieve in the beginning. And, 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 but, and you, you, I know you have faith that you will, even if you, you know, if you ever feel <laughs> that you haven't achieved that in a work, which I feel you achieve it a lot. But um, I, I, I just want to say that, you know, as you know, I interview people for the magazine, for the, mm -hmm. uh, the American Society of Marine Artists News and Journal. Yeah. And one of the questions I often ask artists is about fear, because mm -hmm. uh, I had, I, I had this great experience. It was at this drawing group and many of the guys paint during the drawing group too. So uh, they're actually laying in paint while we're sitting there for three hours or four hours on a Wednesday night. And I realized I wasn't breathing hmm. while I was drawing. And I was like, gas, I went, ah, ah, you know, what's wrong, you know what? And I, I was like, and I turned to this guy next to me and I said, I don't know what's wrong. Like I'm just holding my breath here. He's like, cause you're anxious. And I said, I am, I'm afraid, I said, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with my emotions. Uh, and I was like, I am, I'm afraid. <laughs> what am I afraid of? And he's like, not doing it justice. Exactly mm -hmm. what you said. Yeah. And you know, that fear is so, I find it so fascinating because, you know, when we look at a master artist, like we look at a genius who we admire, we're only seeing five to 15% of their work. Right. right? Maybe 20% of their work. And the other 80% is gone. No, yeah. he's, it, nobody's seen it. It's terrible. They threw it away. They burned it. They, they recycled it. They put it, they painted over mm -hmm. it. You know, this is the thing that all artists need, need to get you know, <laughs> relaxed about because it's like, there's nothing you can do mm -hmm. um, to make more like that. I, and I don't, I don't believe in genius. I believe it's mm -hmm. about preparation and observation and perseverance, yeah. uh, you know, but that's my personal philosophy. Uh, yeah. I think that if you, you know, I know that a lot of people believe in this magical thing called talent. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are people who have been thinking about painting and doing painting since they were basically in utero, uh, yeah. who are natu naturally gifted or talented. And, you know, I have a friend who he's an artist, his wife is an artist, and lo and behold, their daughter is an excellent artist. 
<laughs> right? And, surprised. and I'm like, how can you be surprised? All, all she has seen since she was born is two people making art all day long. Right. So, yep. so and they're like, well, it's obviously natural talent. I mean, I'm like, well, is it, or is it that she's just, you know, I, I have a thing, Yeah. you know, uh, writing, my father was a composer. Mm-hmm. Writing music is not a mystery to me. It's like magic to some people. Right. Right. But I watched my father do it every day. It was just yeah. his job. Right. So, you know, so, and, and, you know, some of his songs are great and they're, you know, people love them. And I'm like, that's great. Uh, it's the same with painting. You know, if you, if you see it done every day, it's not magic. And as one of my shrinks once told me, and, you know, I, I only saw a few, but one of my <laughs> shrinks, uh, he said, I, I was, I was working in the film business at the time and I can't remember what it was. And I said, well, it's not brain surgery. And he said, uh, you know, he's like, have you ever thought that brain surgery isn't brain surgery to brain surgeons? It's just what they do every day. Right. And I, that when he said that, I was like, oh, actually, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Ha- have you ever read the book uh, Art and Fear by David Bales? It's not no. a very big book. It's probably only like that. It might be 150 pages. It's a great book. I'm actually reading it right oh. now. So it's interesting uh, that we're talking about this. I'm going to write it down so I can so I can get it. That's a great yeah. book. David Bales? Yeah, David Bales, B-A-Y-L-E-S. Okay, great. Uh, it's called Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making. And he kind of talks about this idea of of the genius or whatever and the actual practical side of art making and deal with this kind of inner fear that artists have it's been so great um i've been learning a lot and a lot of his ideas resonate with me and i think it's sad with this idea of genius um i totally i totally agree with your um viewpoint but there's so many people that have this idea of genius the reason why i say it's sad is that because of that i think there are a lot fewer artists out there um than there could be because they're like oh well i just don't you know that's only for the select few the special people as it were that are endued with this magical talent power and i don't feel like i have that and so even though i'm interested in it even though art excites me i'm not going to pursue that because i don't have the genius and i think that keeps a lot of people who could be very good artists from ever kind of walking that path. And that makes me sad. <laughs> it, it is, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it, it is a tragedy. Uh, and there's, um, you know, uh, there's a great, uh, do you know who Beverly Sills is? Did you ever hear, of, do you know? Mm-hmm. She was an opera singer, but uh, she had, uh, her daughter was hearing impaired. And uh, she, people would say like, oh, well, you know, she shouldn't sing and, uh, you know, it's terrible to hear her sing. And Beverly Sills said this great thing, she said, you know, if 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 only the birds with the most beautiful, if only the bird with the most beautiful voice sang, the forests would be silent. Hmm. And that's the way I feel about painting. I mean, if if you you know when you hear somebody say, "Oh, I you know I love John Singer Sargent, and I'll never be able to paint like that, so I'm not going to paint." Hmm. You're like, well, John Singer Sargent was raised by art crazed you know nomads who wanted him to paint from the time he was a little kid. He was. You know, he he grew into the role of being an insanely brilliant artist, you know, and and he was trained. He trained his own eye. I don't know how he did it, but his drawings are astonishingly accurate. But even Mm -hmm. him, even he, while he was working on portraits, it wasn't easy for John Singer Sargent. He he, he was famous for, you know, he would spend eight hours trying to get somebody's eye sockets in the right place on their head. You know, this is, and then he would fail and wipe all the work off and start again the next day. Right. So, you know, it, it's not easy for anybody. But if, if mm-hmm. when you look at the finished product, that seems it looks effortless. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I, I know we're a little we're going over time a little and I do. But I have to tell this one story about yeah, one, go of, for it. one of my favorite paintings. So John Singer Sargent painted this painting called El Haleo which I don't know if you're familiar with. It's E-L space J-A-L-E-O. And it's of uh, a, um, uh, a Spanish uh, flamenco dancer in a cafe that mm-hmm. he saw. Uh, and it is a huge painting. It's in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And it is 12 feet across 
and, and eight feet high. It's a gigantic wow. thing. Yeah. Because the frame alone must weigh half a ton. And it's a big, thick, you know, 12 yeah. inch frame too. So, uh, but this painting, it is, looks so effortless and so masterful. When you look at it as a painter, you say, why, why would I bother doing this? I could never do this. Yeah. Now, Sargent, knowing his own obsessional limitations, really admired the, uh, the free looking style of the Impressionists and wanted to paint an Impressionist style painting. And that's what he was trying to achieve with El Haleo. He planned every brush stroke for eight months before he painted the painting. He, he planned out what width brushes he would need to paint the white satin of her dress. He, mm -hmm. he deliberately flattened the musicians against the wall to make them look more like cutouts because that matched an impressionist style. Everything in this incredibly evocative, light, moving, exciting work was planned by a master painter for months. Wow. And he did paint it in a short period of time. He painted it over the course of 10 days. But it, it looks effortless and it looks brilliant and, it, and it's beautiful and inspiring. Look it up after the podcast. I you, will, yeah. familiar with it. Um, and look at that painting. And when you look at her dress and the white thing, and he did studies of her pose. He, her pose is impossible. No dancer could be in that position. <laughs> and he worked on the pose. He had models pose. He had them leaning against things, holding their arms back. It is, it's stunning, but it was wow. all artifice and art. Not, I don't want to say artifice. It was art that he was mm -hmm. applying to this scene. So whenever anybody's out there thinking, I can't do well enough. I'm not a good enough artist. I don't know how to do this. Well, you spend eight months planning out every brush stroke and you might be able to churn out <laughs> a too. Really truly. So anyway, that's where wow. I am. Well, our time is drawing to a close, but I would like to kind of in um, in regards to what we were just talking about uh, for our younger listeners and listeners who are aspiring artists or interested in marine art. Is there one uh, thought or piece of advice that you would like to leave with them um, as they're going out into the art world? Yes, there is one major piece of advice that I give everyone who I talk to, and it's uh, well, it's paint every day or do something for your painting every day. You can draw, you can work on uh, uh, your studio. Uh, if you're, you know, you can do research, but you have to do one thing every day mm -hmm. and preferably for two hours a day. And I know that that's a lot of time for most people. I'm an early riser. So I get up at 5.30 in the morning. So I work from five, from basically 6 to 8 a.m. is my art practice time. And that leaves me the rest of the day. I can do administrative tasks, take the car to be serviced, everything like that, uh, go to a job. Um, but uh, I commit that time. And even if I don't, and if I don't commit that time, I still do one thing every day for my painting career. Mm -hmm. Because then you never forget it. It's very easy when you're starting out and when you're first working to say like, I'll do that on the weekend when I get there. Yeah. Just one thing every day. If it's research, drawing, a sketch, you know, uh, preparing canvases, whatever it is, or surfaces, uh, yeah. one thing a day. Just, a, 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 and it doesn't have to take a long time. <laughs> just, yeah. That. So. Well, that's a lot more, that's a lot more manageable. I think when you're first starting out, you can be overwhelmed by all the things you feel that oh. you need to do, but just focusing on one thing a day, I think that's very helpful. Yeah. So thank you. Well, thank you, Nick. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and spending time talking about art and history and your story. Um, it's been a really pleasure. So thank you. Well, Joyful, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Blue Palette Podcast. This has been your host, Joyful Enriquez. If you would like to learn more info about ASMA, you can find them online at www.americansocietyofmarineartists.com and on all social media platforms.